If you have your Bible, please open it to Mark, first chapter, verses 9 to 11. This is the second book in the New Testament. And then be ready to turn to Acts, chapter 16, verses 25 to 34. This is the fifth book of the New Testament. I'll be reading from the New International Version. The first passage is um, about Jesus' ministry when he was first baptized. The second passage is about Paul when he was in prison in Philippi. Please stand as you're able for the reading of the scripture. Starting with Mark chapter 1 verses 9 to 11. At that time Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, who am I love. With you I am well pleased. Moving down to the second reading in Acts, verse six, chapter 16, verses 25 to 34. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, Don't harm yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your whole household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them to his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God and his whole household. May God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. Amen. Baptism of our Lord Sunday. Again, it's the day that we remember Jesus' baptism, but by extension, we remember our own baptism. And um, today's sermon may seem a bit like a Sunday school lesson. It'll be simple, primarily because I think our faith should be simple. I think sometimes we make things too complicated. You can be sure that that God is, is anything but simple, while at the same time, Scripture tells us that, that even a child can, can grasp the truths of our faith. It's part of the reason why we, we're not having children's church today or won't be having it uh, at the second service either, because we're asking our kids to worship in here, this emphasis on families, because we think God established the family unit first. And whatever constitutes your family, I think we should worship together as families. And if kids get a bit nervous, uh, a little bit uh, uh, restless, that's okay too. Don't get up and run around. I'll probably call you down for that. But, but if they get a little bit noisy, that, that's okay. We'd much rather them be here than, than somewhere else. You know, I remember the story as I was preparing this and I thought about those opening remarks. The story of, of Jesus teaching and, and preaching to, to a great crowd of people. And, and often uh, rabbis would, would stand or, or sit on like an amphitheater and people would be spread out on the grass before, before the teacher. And he would, he would talk to them and teach them. And, and I picture kids running around through the crowd chasing each other, you know, playing games. And, and the disciples, you know, they were interrupting this and they, they rebuked these kids, which is the, a big fancy word for saying, hey, you, settle down. And, or the famous quote, right, where are these kids' parents? And Jesus, he said, let, let the little children come to me. And he, 
he sat down on the ground at least this is how I picture it and he said come up here and he took the smallest ones up on his lap and I picture him hugging them and holding them close and he said you all need to understand the kingdom of heaven belongs to these this is why I came and all of you adults who think that they're interrupting what we're doing need to rethink that. They are the reason why we do what we do. And I just picture his disciples over there going, got that one wrong. Check another one we got wrong off of our list. And all the people going, oh, really? So hopefully I can tell this story and my sermon will be engaging enough for all of our kids to actually enjoy the sermon. Paul and Silas. They were missionaries. i got to get my water. They were missionaries. They traveled the world, and, and the early church sent them out to take, the world, to take the gospel message into all the world, okay? This is their second missionary journey, and they had sailed to Macedonia, Philippi. It's a port city on the Aegean Sea. We know Macedonia as modern-day Greece, okay? So this was the first time that Paul had stepped foot and preached in what we know as Europe. And he was taking the message from the Jews in Jerusalem to the Gentiles throughout the earth. It's what Jesus told us to do in the Great Commission as he ascended, is go, teach, baptize, not only here, but, but everywhere. And so he was in, in Philippi, and this was Greece, right? So it's what their, their perception or their understanding of God would have been heavily influenced by what? Greek mythology. And so their perception of who God was, they would have known about Mount Olympus and Zeus and Aphrodite and, and Apollo and all those gods of, of Greece. So Paul was wondering through this Gentile city, okay, they weren't Jewish peoples. They didn't believe in the God Yahweh of the Old Testament. They're wandering throughout the city, and, and, and they're preaching. And Paul is telling them the story of, of how he was a persecutor of Christians. He would like to, 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 to capture them for believing in this Jesus of Nazareth and, and, and believing in this whole farce of the resurrection, and he would like to throw them in jail. He was traveling to Damascus to do that, and he's telling a story of how he was literally blinded by the light of Christ. And Jesus Christ spoke to him and said, said, Saul, because that was his name before it was Paul. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He was blinded. That lasted for a few days. And he was baptized after the scales fell off by Ananias. And, and, and it changed his life so much that he said, my life is yours. Wherever you send me, whatever the cost, I will follow you. And so he was in Philippi preaching this message to anyone who would listen. People of Greece, you know, people of Philippi. Their message was so convincing that a powerful businesswoman in the community named Lydia, she's like, I got all this stuff wrong. It's not about Zeus and Apollo and Aphrodite and all these, these gods. It's about this one true God. If he could actually speak to him, maybe he could speak to me. And, and they invited Paul and Silas into her home and were told that, her whole household believed and was baptized. Powerful message of conversion. So Paul continues to walk throughout the city, and he gets the attention of this slave girl he and Silas do. And she begins following them around, shouting, These men are messengers of the Most High God. Listen to them. They're telling you how you shall be saved. Now this girl, she made her owners a great deal of money, okay? Because she was said to be possessed by an evil spirit and could reconcile the past and could also see well into the future. She was a fortune teller. And she made her owners a great deal of money by telling fortunes. Have you ever seen a megaphone on top of a car? either in a movie or that. We don't do that in, in here in the United States a lot anymore. But in, I've seen it in other countries. 
Guatemala. We were just there. Big megaphone on top of a car, you know, and someone running for political office and they, they drive throughout town or they're, they're, they're a traveling preacher and they're having a revival, you know, and, and they drive throughout town with a big megaphone on top of their car and, and you hear, vote for progress, vote for John Q. Public, John Q. Public supports families, vote for John Q. Public for mayor. Remember that? Anybody ever see that in Princeton? Huh? Long time ago? Maybe as a kid. Or the street preacher going throughout, you know, the town, driving up and down the neighborhood saying, Repent of thou sins. Thou shalt believe. Thou shalt be saved. Revival at the National Guard Armory tonight. 7 p.m. and bring your wallet. <laughs> Anybody remember that as a kid, driving throughout the street? I remember that in Somerset, Kentucky, whenever I was a kid. Well, that's basically what the demon-possessed girl was doing. She was following them throughout the city, yelling behind them, Believe what these men are telling you. They're telling you how to be saved. They're, they're messengers of the one true God. I don't know why, but Paul got fed up with that. Paul wasn't the most tactful man in the world, and he didn't have the greatest patience in the world. Maybe that was his sin that he got so easily entangled in. But he turned around, and he finally rebuked the girl, and he said, Evil spirits, leave her! And instantly the evil spirits left her. And she was calm and you know, she'd been set free. Well, this angered her owners. Never mind that this girl who had been tormented for all these years was set free because their cash cow, they made money on her fortune telling, their cash cow was gone. Their income was taken. So they had Paul and Silas, long story short, they had them arrested were ruining their property. They had them beaten, thrown in prison. And so Paul and Silas were chained and put in the inner part of the jail. Now, in, in early first century, okay, jails, don't, don't picture Barney Fife and Andy or that taking them to the jailhouse, okay? In, in early first century, you have to remember the landscape of the countryside, there were a lot of mountains and caves and that sort of thing, and, and cities were often built on the side of hills. And so a prison would have been maybe a cave connected to a house or some sort of structure, or an old cistern that held water, they would cut a hole in the side of it or, or stairs down into it, and they would place prisoners down in there, or even holes in the ground that they had dug out. And so it wasn't like necessarily we imagine it it would have been very dark there was no electricity girls okay there was no light it would have been very dark dirty cold and Paul and Silas were told we'll put in the very middle of the jail okay and they're chained either to the wall or to the floor well Paul and Silas they saw this as an opportunity to thank God for their good fortune that now they had a captive audience. <laughs> All of the prisoners in the jail now had to listen to them preach. And the entire house that would have surrounded this prison, they now would have had to listen. And so Paul and Silas begin singing hymns or praises to God. and They begin, begin offering thanks to God and praying out loud and, and talking. And I can imagine all the other prisoners banging and saying, Shut up, we're trying to sleep. And they kept singing. Well, there was a large earthquake because this, this area of the world is subject to earthquakes. There was an earthquake, and, and, and it, we're told that the doors flung open and the chains fell off. Rather than leave, Paul and Silas stayed. Because, see, they had already been set free, and they didn't need an open jail door to give them their freedom because they found that their freedom came from God. So, they continued to sing praises to God. Well, the jailer, his responsibility was to keep these prisoners in jail, all right? And if they escaped, he would pay with his life. Penalty for not doing his job. So he drew his sword and was going to fall on it because he would much rather it be a graceful death, quick and easy, than what the Roman guards would probably do to him. And so, just as he was getting ready to do that, Paul and Silas said, Hey, wait, 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 we're still here. We're all here. As a matter of fact, do you want to come on in and sing with us? This just astounded the jailer. And, and I picture him running in and throwing himself at their feet and saying, I want to know this God too. How can I know this God? 
And they told him. Picture Paul telling him just his basic story. How Jesus spoke to him and told him, even a sinner like you, an evil man who, who hurts people, God wants you to. And the jailer had to think, well, I kind of hurt people too. And, and if God can save him, he can save me. And so it says the jailer believed, and, and, and then everyone in his entire household believed. Everyone. Translation, they had church in this jail in the middle of the night. And the message was so compelling, the worship was so moving, that we're told that everyone in the household believed and was baptized. Now, Maybe I'm a realist, okay? But I seem to think that entire household or everyone in this particular instance means everyone in the entire household, which would have consisted of wife or wives, would have consisted of children, servants, slaves. Even the families of slaves were known to live under one household. And the jailer would have been a pretty powerful man, so he would have had a large household. Everyone in the household believed and were baptized. How were they baptized? I don't know. We're not told that they went down to the local creek or river or ocean. We're not told that they went out back to a creek and they were all immersed in the water. We're just told they were baptized. And I I picture Paul after his wounds were washed and cleansed, saying, bring me a big tub of water with a pitcher, and we're going to baptize everybody in the house so that this house is marked by God and for God. That's what I picture anyway. Today, we celebrate God's goodness. We celebrate God. We celebrate grace being poured out upon us. And we remember. We remember our baptism. We remember what it means. What do we remember? Okay, The vows that we took or the vows that were taken for us. Do you repent of your sin? Meaning, do you want to make sure that whatever's in your heart or on your mind that separates you from God you repent of that. Don't want to do that anymore. Do you believe that, that Jesus Christ was crucified, died, was buried, and raised so that he could raise you to eternal life? Do you believe in the, the Bible, the Holy Scriptures, and that the Old and New Testament contain all that is necessary for salvation, forgiveness of sins? Which coincidentally, those of us reading the Old Testament don't miss the whole Bible's about Jesus. Even though he didn't come to the New Testament, the entire Bible points to a Messiah. Lastly, it's important to remember as we remember our baptism that whether we were an infant, a child, an adult, a young adult, that we all bring the same thing to the waters of baptism. <laughs> Nothing nothing we bring nothing to God but a heart that has the ability to be very very wicked and sinful and hateful but also has the ability to be very very holy and pure once again this water came from the Jordan River and So if there's a little bit of sediment in the bottom, I apologize. If you are a parent and your child has has never been baptized, that's okay. It's a good time for conversation. And don't worry if you can't answer all of their questions. That's okay too. Maybe you can find out together. The Internet's a great place. Also, don't believe everything you read on the Internet, but it's a good place to start. Or you can come see your pastor, and I'll be happy to to have a conversation and answer any questions. I got to have one of those conversations with a little eight-year-old girl this week that really made my week. 
if you're an adult, teenager, whatever, and you've never been baptized, then I would invite you to come talk to me. I'll be glad to answer all your questions. Baptism is simply a marking of individuals by God, whether that is through immersion, whether that is through pouring or sprinkling. Again, I'm not sure that God cares how much water. It's a symbolic marking or a cleansing of an individual by God. So today, we're also going to celebrate Holy Communion, and here's how this is going to work. We will have two stations on either side, okay? So, we will go out this way, receive Holy Communion, and then come back past the baptismal font. And if you so choose to remember your baptism with water, you can just kind of dip your fingers in it, and touch your forehead, make the sign of a cross, touch your face. But remember your baptism and be thankful that God would would choose to pour out his grace upon people like us. Now, Holy Communion also, um, you don't need to be a member of this church or any church to participate. Jesus Christ said, let the little children come to me. That's why we include them in in baptism and talk about baptism. And even if they haven't been baptized, invite them to to touch the water and, and feel the water. That's why we invite kids to participate in in Holy Communion, even if they don't understand it all. That's okay. Heck, half the time I don't understand it all. On the night before he freely gave himself up for us, Jesus sat around a, uh, a table and he was having a conversation with his disciples. He was going to be leaving them. And he took a simple loaf of bread. I'm guessing it wasn't like this. But he, he broke it. He gave thanks to God. And he said, this, this represents my body. It'll be broken for you, and I freely give it. Take and, and eat. As often as you do this, remember. This is the bread of life. I am the bread of life. Remember how much you mean to me and how much you mean to God. And then when the supper was over, Scripture tells us that he he took a cup. I'm guessing it wasn't as pretty as this one. They were simple people. A cup containing wine, which was the drink of the day, the fruit of the vine. And he looked at his disciples and and he gave thanks to God. And he said, this cup, this juice, this wine represents my blood. Which will be poured out for the forgiveness of sins. For many, for everyone. Take and and drink. And as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. Now all of them were Jews. And they knew temple sacrifices required the shedding of of innocent blood of animals to offer up to God as a penance for their sins. And Jesus Christ was saying, I am this sacrifice. My body will be broken. My blood will be shed. And you don't ever need to make a sacrifice again. I am that sacrifice. Take and drink. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on these simple gifts of of bread and juice that as we remember your sacrifice, as we remember your teaching, we pray that you will fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we in turn can be the body of Christ redeemed by your blood for the entire world. Join us in this holy moment as we remember our baptism, as we remember your sacrifice, as we are thankful that you, our God, would pour out your grace upon us 
and make us holy. Pray this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Would you all who are going to be assisting today, please come forward and our musicians come up here as well. Sometimes I neglect to remember to serve the music musicians also we're going to have some baskets and some individual cups at each serving station I know some of you all have said to me you know it's cold and flu season I'm not sure that I want to be taking a hunk of bread off of a place where everybody else is and, and not sure that I want to dip that in the common cup that's okay I think God will bless it and protect us but if you're one of those people that it concerns you or you've been sick we're going to have individually cubed bread and individual cups at the serving station so as you get up to come through the line just drop by there pick up your cube take your juice and then you can make your way through the baptismal font God's table is set, it is open, all are welcome. As Sandy and Steve play, I would invite you to receive Holy Communion, God's holy meal, and then return to your seats, pass the baptismal font, and remember your baptism, and be thankful.